we appreciate you, you coming here this afternoon. Um, this is one of the, the first lectures that we have as part of the Environmental Ethics Initiative on campus. And we appreciate also the Kennedy Center as being a co-sponsor uh, of this and, and the Nature Conservancy as well. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Dr. M. Sanjan. Um, he holds a faculty research position at the University of Montana and is the lead scientist for the world's largest environmental organization, the Nature Conservancy. Um, his research interests focus on, on exploring the nexus between conservation of nature and human well-being, as well as wildlife ecology and environmental education. He, he's an exceptional scientist. His work has been published in journals that include science, nature, and conser conservation biology. He's a Cato Fellow at the Aspen Institute and was recently named an influential alumnus by UC Santa Cruz. He's program advisor for the Clinton Global I Initiative. He, he's a frequent guest uh, on NBC's The Today Show and has appeared on Letterman on CBS as well. And we have a, a few clips that, that rather than me articulating all of the things that he's done, uh, we figured we, we'd show you some of those things and then we'll turn over the, the time to, to Dr. Sondra. sequence and what does it do? Well, it makes that salmon grow twice as fast. It makes it uh, eat voraciously and double its size. We're in a race against the clock. We've been getting most of our energy from one source for over a century. Energy has helped build the modern world. But now, it's time to make a change. It's really difficult to comprehend the numbers. So we can feel it, we can hear it, and you can see it. How do you get the power from here to the cities where it's needed most? Nature is resilient. If you leave it alone, it can come back. Climate change is the biggest environmental issue we have to deal with. Every single person on the planet is contributing to it, and every single person has to contribute in order to solve it. All right, so join with me in welcoming Dr. Sondland. Thank you. So thanks so much to all of you um, for coming out and taking your time out to spend a little time with me um, to talk a little bit about conservation. I'm going to try to speak for probably about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll try and leave a lot of time for questions because it's probably the best way in which I can interact with you and learn from you as much about what you care about um, as much as I can deliver um, uh, in terms of what I'm bringing to the table. So um, we'll try and do that. I'm going to take this jacket off. It's a little bit. Okay. All right. So, so that animal is called the southern, so, sorry, the northern white rhino. And the northern white rhino is extinct in the wild. There are only six remaining northern white rhinos left on the planet, just six. And um, of those six, uh, four of them were at a zoo in the Czech Republic. And last year, those four, which have been in captivity for over 30 years, 
Um, one of them was actually caught in the wild as a baby uh, from southern Sudan, were flown back to Africa um, in this amazing operation. DHL transported these rhinos all the way back to Africa um, and, and sort of set them, quote unquote, free in order to try to encourage them to breed. Because after being in a, a zoo in, in the Czech Republic, and I visited them in the zoo there, um, for that long, they weren't going to breed. Um, it kind of makes sense if you go and see the zoo. It'd be very hard um, uh, to, for, for a rhino or, fr frankly, any, anyone else to uh, <laughs> be interested in procreation. So this is the last ditch effort at trying to save an entire species, the northern white rhino. The southern white rhino populations are doing well, but the northern whites, as I said, are, are virtually extinct in the wild, except for these four. And that's um, a picture of that same rhino in the zoo um, in the Czech Republic. And this is what that situation looks like today. Um, it, by the way, these four or five photos are not taken by me. You, you can tell the difference between my photos, which are rubbish. And, the, and, and um, Amy Vitale took these photos, and they're, they're nice for that reason. But these are, um, this is how you have to go to protect these rhinos right now. So if you go to try and see them in Kenya, you will encounter these armed guards who follow these rhinos around day and night. In some ways, this, because if you don't, what will happen is they'll get poached, and then the horn is worth about $60,000 on the black market because it's thought to have medicinal properties in the Far East. And for a poor, um, a, a poor farmer or a poor rancher out there, it, it's a big incentive, right? So it's extraordinary level of measure that has been going into this one species to try to protect the very last of what remains. Um, armed guards following this animal day and night, virtually. So this is a frog in uh, the Solomon Islands. And that's my hand holding this frog. And I took this picture like a couple of years ago. And this frog has no name. It's a species new to science. Um, and it will have a name at some point in the next year or two once the, once the work's been done on it. But right now, this frog has no name to it. And in the Solomon Islands, it's not that hard to go and find lots and lots of species that are still to be discovered, um, discovered by any people, including Western science, um, for sure. And there's lots of animals like this. And, and this story, too, of this story of discovery, of finding a new species, is another piece of conservation that when people think about conservation, they might hearken back to. Now, why am I showing you these two things? Because because of these two books that were hugely influential when I was um, a student in school and are still very influential in conservation today. So Edward Wilson, E.O. Wilson, may be the most famous living biologist um, out there. Um, he's won the Pulitzer Prize. He's a famous, famous biologist at Harvard, um, has written many books in, in science. And these two books were, were massively popular, and they still are. And when people think about conservation and nature, they still think about this model of conservation, right? So this model of conservation that is this cathedral, if you like, of nature, dripping with biodiversity, dripping with biological diversity, strange species that we don't even know anything about, that you can go out into a forest and pick up and hold in your hand, for whom protection has to come to some extent at the hand of a gun quite literally at the hand of a gun. That's one way of thinking about conservation. And I think it is a way that a lot of people, when they think about conservation or they think about the environmental movement, that is what they think about. Nature dripping with biodiversity, lots of strange and wonderful critters out there, which have to be saved at all costs under great duress at some, in some instances. And I've given you these extremes just to make you think about it. What I'm here to tell you is I think this model of conservation is flawed. And it's not a model of conservation that really could grow. It's not a model of conservation, even though I grew up with it, is going to work for most of the planet. So look at these covers of these books. They're gorgeous covers. 
and they show you the rainforest, and this other one here is a, the water droplet, and you can see a toucan and an orangutan on it, and all this amazing stuff. One's called biodiversity, and he sort of brought that word, you know, the biological diversity of the world. The other's called diversity of life, the grand books. What's missing from these covers? People, right? So we are the biggest agent of change on the planet. We influence biodiversity all the time, both positively and negatively, and yet we are completely missing from these covers. And that's a big challenge because it, it creates instantly a big challenge about how do you try to put people into that conversation, into the movement, as opposed to excluding, excluding them out of the movement. And for me, a lot of my work has been influenced about that tension. But where, where, what's our role? And where, what role do we play? And today, I really want to talk about one slice of that work and really talking about that slice of the work as it influences people who really live at the bottom of the pyramid, the one or two billion people on the planet who live on less than a couple of bucks a day. So my proposition to you is I think they have a huge role to play in conservation and in the environmental movement. See, if you look at our movement to date, you know, it, it's very hard to even think of the environmental movement as a movement. It's more like a niche. It's mostly white, it's mostly older, it's mostly urban, and it's very rich. That's our success. But you can't really create a movement out of a niche. It will always remain a niche. And my proposition is if we can find ways in which we can include larger segments of the population, then you and I would not be the only ones who would be in this room. That this conversation would be happening with all the other students out there who are really not in this room. And so I want to take the other extreme example and go to places where people are very, very poor and ask what role does nature play in their lives and does it really influence them? And if it does, then maybe we have a conversation to have around, around that. By the way, I know Ed Wilson and this is by no means meant to disparage him. I'm a huge fan of what he does. Um, but it's just to point out to you how we really think about nature. We think about it as set apart from humans. The Wilderness Act has the fantastic line in there that talks about apart from man. There's a, there's a very um, purposeful reason of separating humans out of our paradigm when we think about nature and the conservation of nature. All right, so this is a slightly disturbing picture, and I did take this picture, um, but um, I took it in West Africa, in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is one of the poorest countries on earth. For three years in a row, it was the lowest, 198 out of 198 on the Human Development Index. You have to work to be that bad as a country, right? You've got to like, try to do something. The day I landed there, Angelina Jolie was leaving. Now, here's a little tip. If Angelina Jolie is leaving any country, it's probably a pretty bad place to be, right? <laughs> so um, I end up spending a few months in Sierra Leone, and I go to this pretty remote village, and one night, as I go, go, get, go to this village, it was starting to rain, and I see a group of little kids who are burning the fur off a dead monkey that they're going to then cook and eat. And it's not an endangered monkey. It's a Circopithecus, a common spot-nosed monkey that you find raiding crops in lots of West African villages. So the, the focus here is not on the monkey and the plight of the monkey. It's on the kid. And what was interesting to me is I snapped this picture, and I sort of went along, and I put up a tent, and then I ended up sleeping there. But later that night, when I looked at this photo, I realized something. See, the whole time this kid was fanning this flame of this dying fire, he was doing it with a piece of metal that he had cut out from a signboard that you see all over um, the developing world, you know, these metal signboards that advertise everything. And he was using one of these to fan the flames of this fire. And if you look, you can sort of see the words on it. It's a blue wreath, and it has the words WFP on it. Do you know what that stands for? WFP, World Food Program, that's right. And th this was one of those light bulb moments. You know, rarely in life do you really have a light bulb moment. But for me, this was the moment, about five or six, six years ago, when I had that light bulb go off. Because here's this kid who is fanning the flames of a fire in order to actually burn the fur off a monkey, which is what he's actually going to eat, using the signboard cut out of the World Food Program, right? So it struck me at that moment that at the end of the day, when governments fail, when organizations can no longer provide for people under civil war, under desperate and difficult circumstances, it is nature that picks up the slack. 
And that when we go out there and we pull that rug from under the table, we have to be careful that we don't basically take the last security net, if you will, for the poorest of the poor. It turns out that for very, very poor people, you know, things like water, food, fertility of soils, fuel wood, are all things that they get for free from nature. And I don't mean to imply that you don't want people to develop on to, or, and go on a path to development, but in that path, you've got to make sure that you're not undercutting them while doing that. I live in Montana. I live in Missoula, Montana, which is where I call home. And even in my town, in the winter, 60% of the meat that we eat is bush meat. It's basically elk, deer, um, and, and ducks and waterfowl. 60% in winter in a, in a 60,000 person American college town in the West. So, you know, and that's something that is almost taken for granted by residents in my town. And it's, frankly, it's, you know, for this kid, it's far more important. All right, so now I'm going to sort of tell you three small stories of how I see nature playing roles in people's lives and the work that the organization I represent, the Nature Conservancy, does around that. And just to give you one second, uh, not one second, 30 seconds on the Nature Conservancy. So we are an organization that's about 60 years old. We started in New York. Now we're in every state in the US. We have about a million members around the world, around, and mostly around the US. And we work in about 40 countries. Um, a lot of people consider us the biggest environmental organization. But we don't have a big re name recognition because we don't typically do the you know, banners and posters and a lot of you know, sort of in-your-face stuff out there. We tend to work a lot more strategically, often in a very bipartisan fashion, in order to make big conservation happen. Um, and we have a big program in, in Utah that's been going for at least 25 years, just to give you a sense of, of who we are. So this is in a place in uh, Indonesia called uh, um, Raja Ampat. And uh, it's, the, it's the Coral Triangle, and it's one of those places in, in the Indonesian waters that really has an extraordinary diversity of coral reefs. And if you go there, you can you know, see lots of sharks, and, and you also see a lot of sea turtles. So these are both species of concern for us. Um, that's at night, and she's coming in to lay eggs. Um, that's what's going on there. But what's been going on in Indonesia and Indonesian waters is that for the last 30 to 50 years, as human populations have grown, they've become increasingly dependent on the sea. About 150 million people in Southeast Asia depend on the sea for their source of protein. That's their main source of protein. And as that has exploded and big fishing boats have come in and there's an export market, the fisheries in most places in um, the Coral Triangle have collapsed. So some years ago, we and others, working with others, created this concept that we call fish bank. Right? Um, it's basically a marine protected area, but we don't call it a marine protected area in the Solomon Islands or in Papua New Guinea or Indonesia. We call it a fish bank. And the way it's explained to local villages is this. If you are a community, a coastal community that depends on fish, if you can find a reef, an important part of the reef, that should serve as a nursery for fish and set it aside as a bank, then you can live off the interest of baby fish that are born in that nursery and that swim outside that protected area. And it works. It turns out that protected areas, marine protected areas, are a great strategy for making more fish. What happens is, as fish get bigger, they produce proportionately more eggs. So a big fish can actually deliver a lot more babies to the next generation than a smaller fish of the same species can. So if you really want a robust fish population, you need to let at least some fish become really big. So if you can find a piece of the ocean and set it aside as a marine protected area, and ideally use science to figure out where you want to protect it so you get the biggest impact, um, then you can have these big fish live in this nursery produce lots of babies that then naturally swim outside the reef and that, that are then harvested and caught by the villagers and the village communities. This idea has really taken off. And I think we are almost at the point where we've turned the tide or turned the corner. Turn the tide? No. It's turned the corner and something with the tide. That must be like the tide comes back. Um, I didn't learn English as my native language. And sometimes the <laughs> translation in my head goes a little bit astray. Um, 
but yeah, so, so you, you created these areas called marine protected areas. We call them fish banks. They call them fish banks. They're a taboo, and they use that word in, in Indonesia. It's a, the word taboo, it's a word from the Solomon Islands. It's actually pronounced tambu, T-A-M-B-U. It means don't go, danger, don't go, keep out. And that's the word for it. And that's what they call it, and they call these fish banks important resources for the community. And because of that, we really turned the tide, as I said, um, or sail the new tide in some of these areas. But what's interesting that's happened in, in Indonesia, this picture's in the Solomon Islands, is that not only have we created a recovery in fish and sea turtles, which we can measure, so the Nature Conservancy has gone back five years later, 10 years later, and measured the impact of our work. And yes, of course, the fish are doing better, and the bigger sea turtles coming in, and so on and so forth, which is good. That's what people give us money to do, save nature. But what's also happened is people's lives have got better. So we did a socioeconomic study of 2,000 villages in the Solomon Islands five years ago and then today. And we've seen that in f using five different indices of measure, including how many kids go to school, personal household income, in every index we measured, you've seen an improvement. In household income, we've seen a doubling of income. Now, don't get me wrong, these are still very, very poor people. But nevertheless, we've seen a doubling of income in, um, in those communities that have embraced this concept of creating tambu zones or fish banks in their, in their village. To put it in perspective, you know, what this girl has with her are, are sea slugs that are sold in the Japanese market. And just three of those will pay her uh, tuition for one semester in school. Just three of them. So they can have a big impact. There's a shell that is collected there that is used for, for buttons in very, very, very high-end shirts. If you go to Savile Row and you're James Bond and you buy a Savile Row shirt, you'll get a button made out of this shell. And that shell is virtually extinct throughout the Pacific. But in this area, there's still a harvest that can happen simply because of these marine protected areas. So it's very lucrative for local communities as well. Now I'm going to take you to the other side of the world. So um, anyone want to guess where that is? Ah, close. Peru. Peru, very good. It's, it's not quite Peru, but very close to Peru. It's in Ecuador. And it's on the coast of Ecuador in a little town called Puerto Lopez. And if you go to Puerto Lopez, it's a little seaside community. Lots of locals go there, but lots, some tourists go there as well. And you will see a whole series of little restaurants like this right by the sea that serve the standard fare of ceviche and cerveza. You know, uh, you go in there and that's what you get. And I was at this restaurant with a couple of my colleagues, and I met the proprietor, who happens to be this woman here. And her name, this is a true story, is Margarita. Um, <laughs> so Margarita comes out, and I ask her a simple question. I said, what's the biggest challenge to your business? And you know, I thought she would say fish, or she might say the lack of customers, or advertisement, or something like that. But do you know what she said to me? What do you think the biggest challenge was according to her, to running her business. Take a guess. A little businesswoman in a little seaside town in Ecuador. Cash flow, I don't know. Cash flow, yeah, cash flow, that is, that's exactly what I was thinking. No, she said agua, water. Then she takes me, I was surprised, so she takes me out back and shows me her kitchen. She's got a tap there, the tap is open. Underneath the tap is a plastic pink bucket that's waiting there for the minor miracle that might happen that week when that one day when water will flow. She pays the utility bill, but water is less than once a week in frequency. So how does she get water to run her restaurant? It turns out she pays this guy who charges her $25 to go to a river that is dry. I went to the river called the Rampa River. It's a dry river now. It's like, you know, it's a sand river. And he digs a hole in, he sticks the tap through there and he pumps it up and then he sloshes the water all the way back into town and charges her 25 bucks to do it. So her biggest challenge as a small businesswoman in the coast of Ecuador is scaling up is water. So if you go from Puerto Lopez and you go to the city, one of the big cities in Ecuador, the capital, which is Quito, Ecuador, and you're in Quito and you stay at a hotel there and you turn on the tap, you'll get clean cold water, no problem. Now, how does Quito do it? How come Quito has great water, and yet on the coast, you got nothing? Well, it turns out that in Quito, they came up with a really interesting system. So 
A uh, dozen years ago, the mayor of Quito and a guy from the Nature Conservancy, Ecuador program, came to New York. And they were talking about water, and they came up with an, an idea. And the idea was this. The residents of Quito who use water were going to set up a fund that would help pay the Inca communities, these are Quecha Inca communities, who live in the Andes to protect the Paramo grasslands, the watershed that supplies the water to Quito. Right? It was a simple idea. And guess what? It really worked. So right now, there's a small tax, if you will, a small payment that is paid by the biggest users of water in the city. The hotels pay it. If you stay in the hotel, it's added as a surcharge. The bottling companies that bottle the Coca-Cola or the local beer, they pay it. And the electricity company that uses the hydro, they pay it. And that tax is then transferred to Inca communities in the Andes who then, in return for that money, safeguard this grassland. And the grassland acts like a big sponge. In the winter, it soaks up the water. In the summer, it slowly trickles it out like you see here. It's amazing grassland. And otherwise, it would be overgrazed and beaten up and burnt, which then immediately causes you know, flash floods and all those sorts of problems. So the story doesn't stop there. What's amazing about this is, so I, asked, so I went up to one of the villages. And I said, all right, so you're getting money now for protecting the grassland. What are you doing with the money? So here is a group of women who have set up a little shop using Singer sewing machines. They have 20 Singer sewing machines. And they make garments. Now what's interesting about the garments that they make, and there's one right there, there's a skirt right there. I actually bought that skirt. I, I, I honestly did. Um, it doesn't fit me, but I did buy it. <laughs> so they, they got this, um, this thing. And, but what they're doing with these garments is they're not selling it to tourists. In fact, when I said, I want to buy one, they, they couldn't even figure out how to price it for me. What they're doing is they're actually selling it to other communities who live further inland. So it's not a sort of let's run this on the back of tourism sort of thing. It's a real enterprise that these women can add value through this extra income that they get because the money came in and they could build a little center and they could get their sewing machines and they can invest in a better livelihood. And that's all paid for by water. So this thing that started 12 years ago Every year now, Quito puts out $800,000 every year that goes to these upper watershed communities in order to protect it. Now, those watersheds, it turns out, are really important for nature as well. So there's Andean bear out. It's called the Condor Biosphere Reserve. So there's condors, there's Andean bear, there's lots and lots of wildlife. And that's why we care about it. But my proposition is you should care about it too because it really does not just help nature, but it also benefits people's lives. So the last example I want to give you is um, a more recent trip I took. And it's a little bit different um, feel to it. Um, this is in Northwest Canada, in Northwest Territories. Um, um, it's, the, it's a Dene community, the, uh, the Dene First Nation community. They speak this Athabascan language, which is kind of interesting because it's a Dene language that is found in the far north of North America, but it's also found amongst the Navajo. Um, and how the Navajo and the Dene have the same common root language is, a, is still a bit of a mystery. Um, but this is a little village called Lutsuke. And Lutsuke is a village of 300 people that is on the edge of the largest game sanctuary in North America. It's the largest reserve in all of North America. It's called the Thalon Reserve. I had never heard of it. Um, it's that well advertised, I guess. Um, but it's a very, very, very big country. To give you a size of how big it is, it is Glacier National Park and Yellowstone National Park and the Serengeti put together is about half as big as the Thalon. Right? It is big country. Um, now, once upon a time, the Dene were the caribou people. They were the Nupiak Eskimos who hunted seals and walruses who moved inland and started herd hunting caribou. And they were nomadic in their way of life. They moved with the wildlife. It's very patchy when the caribou will show. And they have this amazing interaction with the wildlife. They have mostly settled now. And they've settled because of development, because of mining, because of lots of other things that have now motiva motivated them to settle down. And very few still practice a traditional lifestyle. In this village of Lutsuke, they still sort of hold on to sort of some of their traditional lifestyle. And I wanted to go into the Thalon. And we, the Nature Conservancy is eager to start an Arctic program. And we felt that these First Nation communities, the Dene, would be good, um, 
good partners for us in order to understand this landscape. So the Thalon is defined by a river called the Thalon River. Um, and it's famous because um, in the early 1900s, like 1920, three famous explorers died on that river. When they, when they went there and couldn't find food and they starved, they ended up starving to death. And one of them, a guy named Eric Christensen, kept a diary of every day went by and that diary was preserved. And so we know what happened, at, you know, how the tragedy slowly unfolded. Um, but it's, it's quite a famous sort of spot. So we wanted to go on the Thalon River. But I didn't want to go alone. I wanted to go with the Dene, so I had a couple of Dene elders going with me. But we also took some kids with us. So we took seven kids aged from 5 to 20 um, on this canoe journey along the Thalon. And that sort of gives you a sense of the country. It's boreal tundra, arctic tundra, and it kind of gives you a sense of the, the Thalon River itself. It doesn't all look like this. Uh, this is one dramatic uh, spot on the river. And um, a couple of shots of, you know, we were not supposed to swim according to our lawyer, so they're not really swimming. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I met this guy on this trip, and his name is Joseph Catholic. The Joseph Catholic is a famous family up there, and he's a hunter, he's a Dene hunter. And for him, every day was scouting the land for caribou because we were going to feed ourselves on this three week journey. Um, on, on the Thalon. And I'm going to tell you about the journey. It's online. You can read about it. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about this guy. Um, and, you know, sure enough, one day we do, did encounter caribou and, and, you know, he shot it and did a ceremony around it and gave thanks for it. And we all participated and, and, and ate it. Um, the reason why I, I want to tell you the story about these guys is that when you were out there with them on the, on the land, you really understood the Dene, and you really understood um, how proud they were about this place. And then you go to Yellowknife, which is the biggest city in, um, in the Northwest Territories. And what has happened in Yellowknife is that the Dene don't have a very good life there. They're basically, that society has stratified itself. So you have everyone who works in the mining industry and government who then is supportive of that industry, and they do very well. They earn a lot of money. To buy a house in Yellowknife, this is amazing. This is about one of the most remote places out there. A three-bedroom house is about um, $800,000. It was shocking to me. It was shocking, shocking, shocking to me. A gallon of milk is like eight bucks. So basically, people who have the wealth just push everything. You know, They can afford it, and they can keep doing it. And everyone else just falls below it. And so that divide continues to grow. So I walked around on a Friday night at Yellowknife, and I noticed that the longest line of Dene, of First, First Nation people, standing in line was outside KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. That was the longest line that I saw. It's because that was very, very cheap food that would just fill your belly. And yet when you were out there, you realized that these people were caribou hunters. And all of that spirit, all of their love for the land, was just beaten out of them by the time they were in Yellowknife. So what you saw in Yellowknife was desperate faces, hungry faces, obesity, um, alcoholism. You just saw people who had, be who had been beaten. We've taken the caribou hunters and made them chicken eaters um, and sort of call it progress. And so it really reawakened my feeling that, you know, even for communities like in Lutsuke, where people are poor by our standards, they still have this tie to the land. And when they're out on that land, you can feel it. So Joseph Catholic told me an interesting story. So the first time he went caribou hunting, he was 13 years old. And his dad took him hunting, and they go on a dog sled. And he was excited. You know, his first hunt with his dad. It's a big deal to go hunting caribou. And he's holding on to the dog sled while his dad sat in the, in the sled. And they went off. And this was a year that the caribou had not come near. And so for two days, they were looking for the caribou. And then finally, they see it on the horizon. And the dog surged forward, and Joseph, 13-year-old kid, loses his grip, and he tumbles on the snow. And his dad looks back at him and keeps going. <laughs> so I'm like, what do you do? You know? And he's like, well, I was crying. I picked myself up. I dusted the snow off. And I started running behind the sled tracks. And dad you know, disappears over the horizon. Gone. And then like an hour later, he hears like pop, 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 you know, the gunshot. And then, like another hour later, he sees a speck on the horizon, his dad coming back to pick him up. Now, this guy is telling this story to me as a 45-year-old adult. 
And he's laughing when he's telling me the story. You know, no therapy required for abandonment. <laughs> Because he, it's not bec because he understood. It's not because his father doesn't love him. It's because his father knows in that moment for the Dene, the caribou, is everything. And that he could find a son easier than he could ever find those caribou again. And that connection to the land is really important to me. So um, I'm going to skip that. But, um, so I just wanted to sort of close this up and, and open it up to questions, but just reinforcing these three sort of little stories I've told you. One is about, you know, creating fish banks in Indonesia as a way of supporting income. Another is about a very clever method by which, you know, businesses can thrive while still providing water for its people and protecting the forest. And the third one is about local communities and their love for the land. And I point these all out to you because, you know, many of you will spend a part of your lives and hopefully much of your lives in faraway places. And as you go there for whatever purpose that might be, as you start thinking about how you can best help communities, understand that conservation, even though you might not call it that, could play a real big role in not only making sure that you know, we're good stewards of what's out there, but in also providing a helping hand to folks who might need it, who might need it the most. So the economists put nature on the front pages of its magazine. And you know, the basic you know, dollar sign here is sort of saying, look, nature has value. And if nature has value, then who is really ultimately paying for that value? Um, and that's one way of thinking about it. Um, I think about it a little bit differently. And you know, I think that nature does have value, but the way we monetize that value sometimes can be in terms of real money. But sometimes, like for the Dene, it's also tied up with who they are as a people. So I'm going to end this up by just pointing one little thing out to you guys. And, and this is my plea to all of you. Because I really think that all of you are, you know, in some ways, the luckiest generation that has ever graced the planet. Right? So we're at 7 billion right, right now. Right? On Monday, we hit that mark. It turns out I was baby number 3.5 billion. It's actually kind of true. There's a website. You can go type in your age and, and date of birth, and you can figure this out. Um, um, I was, I really, it is. It's, I'm almost exactly 3.5 billion, right? So in my lifetime, we've doubled. And it, we've done great. Humans as a species, you know, you have a, you have a much longer life. We're not going to die of diseases. The chance of you getting killed by an arrow or an axe or a bullet is vanishingly low. Um, if you're a woman, you virtually can aspire to the highest office on virtually every continent. You know, right now, people are doing great. But it's also come at a big cost to the planet. And that cost is not going to be paid by me and my generation, but it's kind of going to be paid by you and your generation, and it's certainly going to be paid by your kids' generation. Of this, I am completely convinced. So take that into account as you go out and do that, and ask yourself, do you want to leave your legacy on the planet as a debt or as a credit? And that's sort of how I see it. Now, why do I think we're the luckiest generation on the planet? So, for four million years of human history, we've been able to see the planet from one plane. Right? That's the view. You stand out there on a plane, and you can see about two and a half miles. After that, the curvature of the Earth you know, curves, and you can't see the horizon anymore. And that's how we've always seen it. Like, through all of human history, we've seen the world in these tiny little pixels, these pixels that are just two and a half miles pixels that we piece together to get us a picture of what things look like. And then, in one generation, our generation, we went to space, just like that, one generation. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we could see the whole planet, right? And that, to me, is an amazing feat, that all of a sudden, you can see the whole thing. And you can see what impact we're having, but you can also see what we could possibly do about it. So that's why I truly believe that all of you really are in this unique moment in the history of the planet. This moment where you will see the worst, but all of you have the opportunity to really do the most. So thank you, and we can open up for questions. If you need more information about what we do, nature.org, or you can follow what I do on Twitter if you like. So, thank you. So those of you who have to go to class, go for it. But um, I, I'll stay here for 10, 15 minutes, ask the questions.
Um, try to keep it as a question, which would be useful because I'm sure there's people who want to ask something. So go ahead. I'll start right in front. You mentioned the need to get others involved, those people that you said you know, are not sitting in this room. What's the best way to get other people involved Great. while not being abrasive toward them or something Great. like that? Great. So the question is, how do you get other people involved? So that's a really, really good question. It's a very, very hard question to do because he said it himself. He said, how do you do it without being abrasive? Right? So it's something I've struggled with. It's partly why I'm here. You know, I don't get to go to BYU very often and speak to folks who, I bet you, you know, in some ways we have very similar backgrounds, but in other ways we live in different worlds. And so I relish that moment to be able to come out and reach out and speak to all of you and hear from you. So this is my only goal with that. You have to do it with empathy. And you have to do it with love. And, I, and I'll tell you why that word empathy is really important. So sometimes in my organization, we say, well, we're a consensus organization. We like to do things by consensus. Consensus, honestly, is a bad word. It leads to the lowest common denominator, right? What you really want to do is do things with compassion. There's a difference between those two things. So I know it sounds a little bit vague. But I really think the hardest thing for an environmentalist to do, and now I'm just speaking as a conservationist or an environmentalist, is to listen with empathy. And listening with empathy doesn't mean you have to change your beliefs. You know, um, I love seeing wolves in Montana. That's not really popular to say in my state, right? But I love that. It's OK. But I'm willing to listen to my neighbor who has problems with wolves and listening to him with honest empathy, not rolling my eyes in my head when he's talking, you know, but pretending to listen, but really hearing what he has to say. If we can do that with empathy, we can make a big difference in this movement. We have become too politically divided. We've become too narrow in our focus. And there's really no need for that. So I really sort of strongly believe that trying to listen to people with, with this word empathy which is not giving up on your position. It's explaining your position, but being willing to hear, really hear what someone else is saying is the first step in making that, that outreach. Yes, sir. How do we use your ideas and integrate them into you know, like an urban sort of life and still have like a positive impact like what you're saying? Because I agree with a lot of what you're saying and helping other people in poorer countries and such, but we're living in a place where a little bit different. You have to take from a different angle. How is it you, you should do that? Well, uh, there's lots of things you can do on the urban side, right? So if you live in an urban environment, so I think one of the most exciting things going on in conservation and the environmental movement right now is the big urban renewal programs. There are two really cool ideas that are happening in cities today. And these are true whether you know, you're here or in Europe or in Africa if you're in an urban setting. The first one is there's a big movement to retrofit buildings and make buildings more energy efficient. It's a really great idea. It's like a win-win-win. So it creates jobs, it saves energy, it reduces our dependence on foreign oil. So all three of these things are good things to do. So I'll give you a quick number. So if you spend a billion dollars and invest a billion dollars in coal, you'll get about 800 jobs. You invest a billion dollars in nuclear, you get about 250 jobs. You invest a billion dollars in retrofitting buildings, commercial and homes, you get about 8,000 jobs. So a lot of companies, a lot of cities are taking this on and saving energy in the process, creating jobs, and creating ultimately a better urban environment. The second thing that's happening in cities that I find when I go around and give talks in cities is that there's a big movement right now to grow food within city boundaries. And I think it's a cool idea. You know, it's this notion that agriculture should not be removed from people's lives and just shunted off to far, far away places. You know, we use a lot of resources for agriculture, and we still don't do a very good job of feeding the world, right? You know, 78 to 80 percent of the water we use is in ag, and a lot of it, frankly, is wasted. We can do it a lot better, provide higher quality food, you know, that's just grown more efficiently. And there's a big movement to bring food growing back into communities. And I think it's a cool idea because it connects people back to nature, back to land, and makes them think, makes them think about where milk comes from. Or, you know, that 2,000 gallons of water goes into making a pair of jeans. Um, so those are two movements you can get involved in, I think, on the urban side that still, you know, doesn't require to go out into forest and do catch sharks or whatever. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. You might, some of what you talked about might hit on this, but I'm kind of curious.
curious as to what you think you're in conservation, what your top two challenges are, and what your top two opportunities are, and whether those align or not. Right. Um, top two challenges and opportunities. Um, so the, I'll, I'll just do one challenge. We'll start with one. So the big challenge for conservation is how do you make conservation run in a self-sustaining way? If conservation 10 years from now still means me asking you for money and then taking that money over to some other place, to Africa or Asia or Latin America and then spending that money and then coming back to you again and asking you for the same amount of money and doing it over and over again, we're going to be stuck in a rut. You know, we know that philanthropy, donations, is hugely important for conservation. I mean, it, it, of course it is. Money is, of course, important. But as long as money and conservation are tracking, we can never break through. What we need is philanthropy to grow, but we need conservation to ramp up. And so what I would love to see is more models of conservation that rely on a self-perpetuating mechanism to continue to fund themselves. So the water fund is an idea like that. So the initial investment came from private donors to set it up. But once it's set up, 12 years now, we haven't put a cent into it, and it continues to grow. Um, the other one, in terms of challenges, how do you make this a more inclusive movement? And I mean, particularly with kids. How do you bring kids more in? They're impatient for change. There's a feeling of change in the air. We just need to be able to capitalize on that and give them something real and tangible in order to do that. So, yes, sir. Sure. I was a freshman at one point too, believe it or not. <laughs> Okay, so, right. So his question is, I get this question fairly frequently too. Look, I'm just in high school. I'm just in grade school. I'm just a kindergarten. Hmm? I have had that. I am just in kindergarten. Okay, so that's just baby voice. What can I do? So the good news is that right now, you have more power in your hands than 99% of all of humanity ever had literally probably in your pocket if you have a you know, cell phone or something like that. So it's what's amazing about today is that you no longer have to wait in order to make an impact. That if you can get others like you, you can collaborate almost instantly using social platforms. And you can make those platforms powerful enough to really create change. It's amazing what Young people can do, look, who would have ever thought, like who would have ever thought that basically a student and young people and poor people revolution could bring down Hosni Mubarak, who was so firmly in power in Egypt? I, you know, no one, no one would have said this. But, when, you know, I talked to uh, Mohammed al Baradi, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for his work with the Atomic Agency, and he's sort of one of the leaders in, in Egypt. And he was, he's, an old, he's an old guy, but he was saying to me that all of a sudden he started seeing this huge increase in Twitter and Facebook. He doesn't actually do it. His secretary does it for him. And he's like, what is this? So she shows him, and he was stunned by the conversation going on like two years before that revolution hit. So, you know, the good news that I'm trying to tell you is that What's nice about living today is that you can be impatient for change, and you can make change happen right now simply because the tools are now being delivered to you. You have a way of connecting with virtually everyone else in the world and others who are freshmen just like you in your class, in your campus, around the world in order to do it. Um, if you want to do one simple thing, donate your birthday. So you have a birthday. Instead of getting presents on that day, take that effort or ask your friends to donate that birthday to do something for the Nature Conservancy or some other charity or something you believe in. It's a very simple act. And then tell your friends about it. Tweet about it, put it on Facebook, get it out there, which, because that's the power you have. It's not that, that your friends and you might raise 500 bucks, which is great and we'll take it gratefully. <laughs> but the power is you can then tell others who will then be motivated to do the same. Take one, one more. In. Oh, I, I should point out, David Livermore is um, the head of the Nature Conservancy in Utah. And I just wanted to point him out, so if you have any. Do you want some materials on yeah. The right on the ground, sure. So I'll stop with that, I think. Is that OK? All right. All right, Thank you.
Is that one of these two?